we've not had one in a little while. Um, I'm Becky Davis, the director in the Office of Special Education Services at the South Carolina Department of Ed. Um, if I could remind everyone to please mute your device, your phone, your laptop, computer, and we will be recording this. Um, Sandy is going to monitor the chat box for me and we will um, look at our agenda now. So we're going to just do a couple of quick updates and reminders, talk a little bit about um, a survey that will be coming to you right after the call and then some reminders about indicators 11 and 12. Um, the OSEP differentiated monitoring and support process. Um, if you remember, South Carolina was uh, lucky, and you hear the quotes around that word, enough to be chosen for the first cohort of that new monitoring process um, back in October. We finished the fiscal piece of our general supervision puzzle and from there have just sort of been on hold. We had our fiscal call the beginning of January. OSEP subsequently has canceled uh, several of our calls, um, both with South Carolina specifically and with all the states in cohort one. So we're just kind of on hold for that. OSEP assures us that they are working hard to get the other pieces of this process in place and we'll have those to us soon. Our, we on um, February 1st, we submitted our annual performance report, um, our APR, that was part of our state performance plan. And as you know, we have typically, we have a six year state performance plan and that has our 17 indicators, graduation rate, dropout, those. Um, and we have targets in all of those areas. We have to report annually on February 1st what our progress as a state towards those targets were, um, was. And we submitted ours um, actually a day early. Uh, at this point, OSEP will be reviewing all of those APRs from all the states and territories for Part B and from all the states and territories for Part C. Um, OSEP will then open a clarification period that probably will be in April where they will talk directly with states to ask questions, to ask for clarification, um, to address any questions that OSEP may have that we will then respond to and OSEP will then make the state determinations um, typically in June um, and then it, to back up a little bit we will have our draft LEA determinations to you for review this says May it should say April um, and then shortly following the state determinations when we receive ours, we will send out the LEA determinations. Um, and I'll talk more about LEA determinations in just a minute. This was the last, um, again, SPPs typically are for six years. OSEP extended this state performance plan for one additional year. Um, and so we closed out this state performance plan with this um, APR that we just submitted, which leads um, into the next slide. So we are now working on the new state performance plan. This will be a six year plan. Um, if I could get everybody to mute, please. Um, so our new plan will be due February 1st, 2022. Uh, same indicators. There have been several areas within indicators that have been added. We've talked about some of this in the past, and we will be talking about this much more extensively. Um, and sort of as a reminder, the state performance plan is the foundation for everything we do in um, OSIS. It is our, it's our 
the indicators are organized or we have organized the indicators around our four focus groups, early childhood, social, emotional learning, academic and post-secondary outcomes. Um, we will, for this SPP, remember the six years, we will be setting new measurable and rigorous targets for all of the performance indicators. Um, and stakeholder engagement in all of this is going to be crucial. So we are in the process of developing some awareness information presentations for different audiences. So, for example, when I talk with you, the LEA directors and coordinators about the state performance plan, you already have a good base of knowledge. Um, so the information that we talk about will be different than uh, when we talk about it with teachers. We want teachers to understand why the state performance plan and the indicators are crucial to what they are doing and how what they are doing impact directly the district's performance and then as a result, the state's performance. Um, we also want to talk with parents and community, community members, members about why this is important as well. And again, if I could get if everybody to mute. So our conversation that we have with stakeholders, particularly with parents, uh, will be different than the ones we have with, with you. Uh, but we want all groups of stakeholders to understand what the state performance plan is, why it's important to our students, and how we will be working to support districts, to support schools in improving outcomes in all of these areas. We also want to develop or working to develop a quick and efficient way to solicit input from all of the stakeholders on not only the proposed targets, but also the activities that we'll be completing that will lead to uh, achieving these targets. The targets do need to be measurable uh, and rigorous. Um, for most of you who have followed the our annual performance reports over the last several years, you know that we have, as a state, exceeded our target for graduation rate for students with disabilities year after year after year. So we want to make sure that the uh, targets that we are setting are rigorous, <laughs> excuse me, and achievable, uh, but set high expectations in all areas. And if I could get everybody to mute and I am trying to change the slide. Hmm. Uh, give me just a minute, it may have frozen. Well, it will go back, but not forward. All right, give me just a minute to figure this out, please. I apologize for this delay. Um, you can see the, the circle. What we may need to do is just go through it like this. And again, I apologize for the format that it is smaller. Uh, let's see if I can increase. It helps just a little bit. All right, Michelle Williams Young, our fiscal team lead, is going to talk about a couple of fiscal updates at this point. Michelle? Thank you, Becky, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, just a few reminders and uh, fiscal and grants administration updates. 
Uh, please be reminded to get your FY21 IDA budgets into GAPS as soon as you can. Now, I do understand that a few districts were late in getting their GANs, and we would like to sincerely thank you for your patience as we work through some issues with our grants office to get those prepared and out. But we hope that by the end of the day, uh, all districts will have their GANs, and uh, then we'll work um, as fast as we can with our grants accounting department to get those last few uh, budgets into gaps but but 90 percent of you should have your budgets should have all your GANs everything should be in the gap so uh, please make sure to get those in um, your budgets allocated in gaps and we will uh, work as fast as we can to get those approved um, for you in addition uh, just a reminder that um, quarterly update balance reports are going out this week and um, we're asking that you remember the first in first out rule um, as we prepare these uh, balance reports we noticed that some districts were very close to uh, having expended all of their FY20 funds but had a lot of their FY19 and those FY19 supplemental funds still unexpended. So I'm not sure if that's um, a matter of just not getting in uh, the reimbursement request but please do remember that both the FY19 and the FY19 supplemental funds expire September 30th of this year. OK, as well as the FY20, we got the extension on the um, on the 19 uh, and 19 supplemental, but you have all three of those expending. So please um, keep those, excuse me, all three of those expiring September 30. Um, so please keep those things in mind. Uh, a few fiscal date reminders, um, the LEA MOE calculator was due February 1st. Please, 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 if you have not gotten those in, uh, please get those in uh, to us as soon as possible. Um, in addition, the uh, excess cost calculator is due February 19th. So uh, please try to adhere to those uh, deadlines. We'd like to get those reviewed and get any um, updates out to you as soon as possible. Um, in addition, um, the financial aid requests for reimbursements are due February 10th. Now remember that you can request uh, reimbursements twice per year. Um, it, or you can only request it once. So uh, the first request can be done in February 10th. Um, and if um, you want to just wait and do all your reimbursements August 5th, uh, you can you can do that. But August 5th is a drop dead deadline. That is a state mandated deadline. So if you miss that, um, you know, that's going to be a, a really, really big issue. But again, just remember, if you want to to get um, those in uh, and request reimbursement for the first half of the year, which is pretty much July through the end of the year, December, then you can get those in by February 10th. Um, also, the application for reimbursement must include the completed and signed request for reimbursement, which is Section 2 as well as a current IEP and a current PWN uh, that covers the period for the requested reimbursement. Now, we are trying to put in protocols in place to remind you um, if you have a PWN or IEP or even a contract that expires during this period, but uh, please make a note of that. We, we can't process any reimbursements if those things are not current and everything should be submitted to Talani Edwards. Um, a few other uh, reminders in regards to financial aid. Um, with financial aid, we uh, PWNs and IPs again must be current and not expired. If an IEP was conducted virtually, please provide and include all participants in the meeting on the IEP as well as on the PWN. So we've received some that did not um, include those participants listed. So please make sure to do that. Um, as well, uh, when placements are made by another agency, 
IEPs must be completed as soon as possible after the LEA becomes aware of the change in placement. We've been receiving those, um, some of those significantly later uh, than we should. So it's recommended that you have an IEP completed within 10 days of uh, the placement. Um, as well, please be aware that some private placements may have limitations on the type or amount of related service they, they uh, are able to provide. However, the IE team must make individual decisions based on the needs of the students. So it is still the LEA's responsibility to make other arrangements when necessary to make sure that you're complying with the IEP requirements. And as usual, uh, please feel free to reach out to me or any of the fiscal and grants management staff uh, with any questions or concerns you have. Thank you. So evidently I did not. So these are the other slides. So um, let's see if we can go back. Ha, yay. So we're going to be sending out a compensatory services survey following this um, this call. We have the possibility of having some of the latest round in ESSER's funding uh, being able to designate that to help districts pay for compensatory services related to COVID. Um, so we're trying to gather preliminary information um, and would really appreciate you responding to this very short survey. Um, and the first question, most of the questions um, are multiple choice or yes, no. Uh, but if, uh, so the first question is, have you had any compensatory services meetings related to COVID? In other words, have you had any IEP meetings so far where the team discussed the possibility of compensatory services, whether the district brought it up or whether the parent brought it up, that were related to COVID, either in the spring or continuing. If you answer no to that, then you're done with the um, with the survey. If you answer yes, then we want a little bit of information about how many students you've discussed this for already. Um, if you've awarded compensatory services, kind of what the range um, has been, the, the lowest amount you've, you have determined necessary, the highest amount, um, just some, some general information like that. Now, please remember that we understand we are only in the beginning of this process. So no decisions as far as allocations or or how we're going to allocate the additional funding um, will be made based on the survey results. We just are trying to get an idea so that we can know a little bit better about how much to um, set aside for from this latest um, ESSERS to funding. Um, and we will be getting more information about that and passing it on to you in the future. We probably will be sending out this survey at least one more time because again, we want to, we, we figured this was the best way to kind of keep track of, of what you're facing and, and what's going on in your district. Um, but again, we understand that, that even if you say we have had zero meetings at this point, that that doesn't mean that you won't have a turn around and have a meeting tomorrow. So this is not this is just the beginning of this kind of information gathering process. But that survey link will be coming out uh, in an email from me following this meeting. Sandy, do we have any questions in the chat box? We do. Are we still differentiating between compensatory services and supplemental catch-up services due to COVID? Yes, um, we are talk we're not talking about supplemental and I think the directions in the survey make that clear. We're not talking about supplemental services, catch-up services. We are talking about when the district um, was unable to provide services to a student that constituted a denial of FAPE due to COVID and has to provide compensatory services. So an example might be 
for a child with significant physical impairment um, who needed hands-on physical therapy and that you were not able to provide that because of health and safety reasons. Um, and you're now at the point of determining whether or not compensatory services are owed. Okay, another question? No, we are good so far. Okay, good deal. Some reminder, because we have just submitted our annual performance report and had to submit our numbers for indicator 11 and 12, um, I wanted to remind you of a couple of things with this. Both of these indicators are compliance indicators. And so the target is set for us by OSEP at 100% because all children, every single individual child for whom we get consent to evaluate is entitled to have their evaluation completed within 60 calendar days or every single child who was served by Part C that we call BabyNet and is referred to, uh, to us as the Part B agency is entitled to have, who is eligible, is entitled to have an IEP by the third birthday. Um, as those of you who know, and because this is an individual entitlement law, IDEA, the I is individual, um, individuals because it's it's an, an individual entitlement law it may look good to say that we're at 99 percent or 98.7 percent but that means that there were two percent of the kids out there somewhere that did not get the process to which they were entitled um, you know that we have valid reasons for delays, and we're going to talk in a little bit more detail about those, and invalid reasons for delays. Um, when we look at this, the state education agency is required to identify whether there were systemic issues if the district is not at 100 percent and or individual student level noncompliance. Um, and then, and we'll talk about the sufficient details in the comments in just a minute. So for indicator 11, the valid reasons for delay is that the parent, now remember this whole process starts when you receive the signed parent consent for evaluation. That starts the clock. If after that the parent revokes consent to eval prior to the end of 60 days, that stops it. Um, if the parent repeatedly fails to produce the child for evaluation, that may be a valid reason. This is typical only or applicable only for virtual settings, however. If if you're in a face-to-face -face setting with a child, you've got access to that child in the school setting. And so the parent, there is no parent failing to produce the child. If you're in a virtual setting, however, um, for example, our virtual charter schools, in those situations, the school has to make an appointment with the parent for the parent to bring the child into some location for any face-to-face -face assessment that has to be done. In that case, if the parent keeps failing to complete those appointments, um, if you have good documentation that you have made repeated attempts, and we'll talk about what that means in just a minute, um, it, that may be a valid reason to have gone beyond your 60 days. If the child transfers from one LEA to another during the evaluation process and the new LEA and the parent agree to extend the timeline, that may be a valid reason for delay. But, it, but the parent and the LEA have to agree to the extension. So the invalid reasons for delay, holidays, fall, winter, spring break, summer, um, and let me talk about those for a minute. 
when you get consent to evaluate signed on May 1st, you know you're going to be out of school for the summer. OSEP doesn't recognize holidays, weekends, fall, winter, spring breaks. They don't recognize summer. Our regs say 60 calendar days, not 60 school days. If you get consent to evaluate signed November 1st, you know that you are going to lose, in addition to your weekend days, you're going to lose Thanksgiving break, and, uh, and you will also lose winter break. Those don't come as a surprise, so plan accordingly. And I am not saying delay getting consent to evaluate by any means. What I'm saying is make sure you are aware of what's coming up so that you can plan accordingly. Um, if you are waiting on an outside evaluation like an audiological or a hearing eval or a vision eval that the team requested, the team said we need this as part of our evaluation, um, that is not a valid reason, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, if you're in if a child's absence is not a valid reason. Um, and I'm going to stop here and say I am a school psychologist by training. I have sympathy for this. Believe me, I do. I have been in the situation where I was juggling six schools with 100 referrals during a school year, 120 referrals, and having to not only keep track of timelines, but get all kids um, assessed. I also understand that we have some smaller districts that are contracting for speech services, for school psych services, and that contractor may only come one day a week. I understand that. OSEP does not consider those valid reasons. So the child being absent on the day that the school psych is in the district is not a valid reason. And I'm going to put a pin in COVID just a minute. Um, so all of that to say, we did ask you in your comments this year to indicate whether or not your delays were due to COVID. Did COVID keep you from being able to complete that evaluation within the 60 calendar days? We were required to report to OSEP the delays over 60 days that, did, that were not valid reasons. Remember, OSEP considers the valid reasons as parent revokes consent, parent repeated, repeatedly fails to produce the child or the child transfers, and the new LEA and parent agree to extend. That's all pretty much that OSEP recognizes. So what I'm saying is these other things, holidays, fall, winter, break, summers, um, the evaluations that you have requested from outside sources, all of those things you need to plan for. And I know we've got some questions, so I, um, let me get through this slide and then we'll stop. Again, if, the, if you're looking at the parent repeatedly failing to produce the child, you've got to have your documentation of repeated attempts by the district over the course of that 60 days to schedule the appointments. Um, in the comments section, include the dates you have attempted to schedule the appointments. So over 60 days, which is about two months, we're, you're going to have to have documentation of more than two or three attempts to schedule these appointments. Um, it, you really, this has to be repeated failure. If a child transfers, in order for this to be a valid reason for delay, you've got to have the new district and the parent agreement to extend and talk about that in the comments. Um, and so if we were to ask for your documentation, you would have the email back and forth between the district contact and the parent to say, um, you know, you transferred from Richland 1 to Richland 2 uh, with only 10 days left in the 60-day timeline. 
Um, would you agree to extend this to give us a chance to get to know the student and gather the rest of the information? Parent says yes, that's your parent and district agreement. 60 days is 60 calendar days. You cannot in exclude weekends, breaks, or unexpected weather. And here is where I'm going to say, if OSEP won't accept a pandemic as a valid reason for delay, they aren't going to accept that we got two inches of snow and that closed our schools for a week. When we had to report in our APR that we just sent off, uh, we had to report all students beyond. We could not count COVID-related delays as a valid reason. I said from the beginning, we will take, as a state, we will take this hit. We will not pass this hit on to districts. So when we turn around and look at district determinations, we will take into consideration how many of those delays were due to COVID. And, and you will not take a hit for that in your determination. Um, this is, and it, it, I don't remember the exact numbers, but we did, no surprise, have a significant increase in the number of delays we had. Um, we also had a significant decrease in the number of referrals. And what that tells me is that our referral season, we have hurricane season, we have IEP season, we have referral season, is typically in the spring. Um, and so students were not at school. And so a lot of the referrals that may have been made typically in the spring were, were postponed, um, trying to survive and figure out what we were doing in a pandemic. All right, I'm gonna stop there. Sandy, what questions do we have? Okay, we have three and then we have someone who raised their hand. So you may have answered them, but I'm gonna go ahead and read them just in case the person who wrote them doesn't think it's answered. So what about assessments over the summer and privately, uh, private school place students in the 60 day timeline? They aren't technically virtual students. Read that last part again about virtual. Those students listed above aren't technically virtual students. So do, does it have to be on your one slide you said for virtual students? So, okay, that is, um, that would be another uh, example of where that parent repeatedly failed to produce would fall. Um, the summer, again, we will take that into consideration, but this is where your comments in the comment section are going to be critical. You've got to give us enough information uh, to, for us to, to figure out what's going on. So, for example, if you get consent to evaluate May 1st and you're gathering some of your information, summer starts, school ends, um, and you're trying to make appointments for the parent to bring the child in to finish the assessment, um, that's where we would be looking for repeated attempts. It might be weekly, it might be more than weekly of when you're trying to get this done. Um, and the same thing, so with with private school students, um, you know, it's going to depend on how your district handles that. When I was a school psych in a district, I went on site at the private school. We had the private school folks participate in the evaluation planning meetings. Um, and then uh, once we got consent to evaluate, I would do the evaluation at the private school. Uh, but if the way you do it is to have the parents bring the student to a location, um, again, we will be looking for repeated attempts. Okay, what else, Sandy? Um, does this failure to produce the child apply to districts that are face-to-face -face but also hybrid and virtual? They've had that issue when the parent has the child registered as hybrid but then continues to skip the testing appointment. So my question would be, if the child is in a hybrid setting, theoretically, and again, I know, and, and remember folks, this is brand new to everybody. Um, so theoretically in a hybrid setting, you would have that child face-to-face -face half of those 60 days. Now again, I know we throw out weekends, but theoretically you've got that child in a face-to-face -face setting 
half of that time. Um, so it would be a little more difficult to justify repeated failure to produce in that situation than it would if the child is completely virtual. And then the last question is, how should we proceed with students who are experiencing multiple periods of quarantine? During, an, during the evaluation process, I'm assuming. Yes. Um, again, documentation is going to be critical and that, co that comments box is your friend. Um, I'll stop short of saying you can't put too much information in that um, because I know that there can be too much information, but the, the comments box is where you will explain that and you'll say, you know, we'll see that consent to evaluate was obtained October 1st and then you document student quarantine for two weeks from whatever to whatever. Um, student back in school three days quarantined again from whatever to whatever. Be specific about the quarantine. Um, don't just say student was quarantined. Put the dates in there that the student, and, and that, again, we're going to have to take the hit as a state for that unless OSEP looks at all of these annual performance reports from the states and says, okay, we'll, we'll look at doing this a little differently. Um, we know we're going to take the hit for that as a state. We will not pass that hit on down to the district for COVID-related issues, but you've got to be specific that it is a COVID-related issue. And, um, and one of the things that we'll be looking for down the road is what have you, how have you tried to accommodate for that? Um, some of the things that, that state directors have talked with OSEP about is that, you know, we reached out to some of the testing companies and districts did to say, can this particular assessment be administered virtually? Um, are you trying to come up with, with a method to be able to administer the assessment virtually? Did you explore as a district other um, assessments that could be administered virtually that would give you the same information. So those are some of the things that we may need to provide to OSEP in the future. Sandy, other questions? Yes, Rita had her hand raised, so I don't know if Rita wants to go ahead and unmute and ask her question. Sometimes the hand raise is accidental, so. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So that's indicator 11. Um, again, if OSEP won't accept that a pandemic, a global pandemic that is almost a year long at this point, as a valid reason for a delay, they're not going to care that little bitty Blythewood got two inches of snow and it closed everything for a whole week. Um, again, holidays, breaks, um, those kinds of things don't, don't count. Now, when we had our coastal districts involved with the, the hurricane and the back-to-back the -back issues that required, again, we took the hit as a state. We won't pass that kind of thing along to you as a district. All right. Again, if the evaluation team asks for information or needs information, then it's the district's responsibility to obtain that information at no cost to the parent. This includes vision, hearing, audiological, occupational therapy, any other type of assessment or evaluation that the district is asking for as part of the evaluation process or the completion of the evaluation process is dependent upon is up to the district not only to obtain that at no cost to the parent, but to obtain it in within the 60 days. Um, that may mean working with the parent to schedule the appointment if it's with a, a physician, 
provide transportation to and from the appointment or even paying for the appointment. Because remember, um, all of the services under IDEA, including evaluation, are at no cost to the parent. Um, this indicator measures the time the signed consent to avow is received until the evaluation is completed, not until eligibility is determined. Um, we had some districts that said we finished the evaluation on time, but we didn't determine eligibility. And the date they closed the evaluation was date of eligibility. So you got gigged for not completing the evaluation in a timely manner. Remember, the evaluation process is completed when the team has gathered all, every bit of the information that the team has requested, administering assessments, scoring assessments, obtaining and scoring rating scales, whatever it is that the team has requested, you've done all of that and you've scored it, that closes the evaluation. Then you determine eligibility. Now, some folks have that all in one and that's fine, but your obligation in this indicator is to complete the evaluation within 60 days, not to determine eligibility within 60 days. That's the next step that happens. Before I go on to 12, Sandy, other questions? Yes. Um, one of them was, hold on one second, I'll have to scroll up here. Um, what about situations where a school district did not complete an eval within 60 calendar days because the parent refused to sign a COVID waiver to waive liability? That, again, that's COVID related. Um, it, as far as reporting to OSEP, that is a non-valid reason. Um, there and that would be something there's been lots of discussions about the legality of COVID waivers or requiring parents or school staff to sign those. Um, if we reach a point where OSEP is considering allowing for COVID related delays, that would be something that we'll need to discuss with our Office of General Counsel to see about the legality of that. Um, you know, again, there was lots in the news. I'm sure everybody um, ha has seen the, the news stories about uh, some of the districts that required or tried to require that kind of, of waiver or liability form signed. Um, but again, right now, that's not a valid reason. Um, if we reach a point in discussions with OSEP that they may consider COVID-related reasons, then we'll talk with that with um, our office with Barbara Drayton and our Office of General Counsel about it. Sandy? Yeah, one more. It was basically it's a comment and a question. Um, should South Carolina consider school days instead of calendar days like some other states? Um, we so here's the issue with that. We could mm. We have thought about that. The problem is OSEP has been very clear time and again that they do not allow for breaks. I know that some states have in their state regulations that it's excluding summer break. OSEP's been very clear to say that's not legal. Um, I can't answer the question as to how that continues to be with states. It may be that OSEP just hasn't noticed that for those particular states, but OSEP has been very clear that that's not a valid reason. Um, we could go with uh, 60, uh, well, with a time, whether it's 60 or 45 or whatever it is, we could go with business days, which would include summer. It would include it wouldn't necessarily include all holidays, um, but that might give district, and, but it would exclude weekends. So that is something that we can look at. Um, as, as most of you know, if the regs say 60 days, if it's not otherwise specified, it, um, it's intended to be calendar days, but that is something that we could consider. Anything else? No, ma'am. 
OK, indicator C is somewhat similar. And remember, this is the requirement that all student children who are served by Part C, our baby net, and referred to the, the district, Part B, um, are evaluated, determined eligible, and have an IEP in place by their third birthday. This, and there's a sort of a, a misleading um, print in this slide. Um, the 60 days does not really apply here. The, the defining point rather than the 60th day is the child's third birthday. So with this, um, you know that, that our Part C counterparts are supposed to make the referral, the transition meeting um, 90 days before the child's third birthday. And then you pick up and go from there. You get cons you have your evaluation planning meeting, your consent for evaluation, um, and you proceed. In this one, this would be a situation because we don't have mandatory attendance for, we don't even have programs for three-year-olds uh, or two-and-a-half-year-olds in the public setting. Um, so you don't have access to the child like you would a school-aged child in a face-to-face -face setting. So in this situation, if the parent revokes consent during that time prior to third birthday, and I'll change this before we post it, um, or repeatedly fails to produce the child for the evaluation, again, repeated, you've got to have documentation that you are making repeated attempts to schedule that evaluation or those appointments. Or if Part C sends you the referral uh, after the 90 days. Um, and, and so Part C has to report, they have an indicator that talks about this same transition. So if they are late in sending a referral, it's going to reflect on the Part C on BabyNet rather than on us. So those are the valid reasons. Invalid reasons, again, holidays, fall, winter break, summer, it doesn't matter if the child's birthday, if the child turns three in July. There has to be an IEP in place by the child's third birthday. Now, this doesn't mean services have to start then. If the child has a late spring birthday or a summer birthday, if the IEP team determines that extended school year services are not needed, then the IEP start date could be the beginning of school. Again, you cannot, you can't, a valid reason is not waiting on outside evaluations, weekends, or COVID. Um, so the, with the repeated failure of the parent to produce, you've got to have that documentation. Include those dates in the comment section. Um, if the transition, if the referral is late, include that in your comment section. Again, the comment section really is your friend. Um, Sandy, any questions about indicator 12? No, ma'am. OK, so let's talk about correction of noncompliance. Um, your data, as you know, we, we, we run these data, or these data run from July 1 to June 30th of every year. Your data are due for both of these indicators toward the end of July. Our staff is going to verify and begin to analyze these data um, and start to look at whether these findings are systemic and or individual student level. Um, this is where we start looking at the comments. Now, if something's unclear, we will come back and ask questions, but the more information and the clearer your information can be in the comment section, the quicker this will go and the easier it will be. Um, so there are two kinds of findings that might happen. One would be systemic, and that would be something to do with your policies, procedures, or practices. Uh, do you have in your policy that you exclude weekends? Um, do you, are your policies and your procedures correct, but you've got one particular person who continues to go over time and again, for whatever reason. Um, those would be systemic findings. The individual findings are more along the lines of the out of the blue, it was a blip, 
um, oops, we just, you know, we forgot that there were 31 days or 30 days in September. We were thinking we had an extra day at the end of September. Those kinds of of isolated incidents. They're not, there's not a pattern. Um, it was, you can't always control everything and stuff just happens. So two types of noncompliance, systemic and or individual student level. So again, with the systemic, if, if there are systemic findings of noncompliance, you're going to have to review your policies, procedures, and practices to determine where the issue was. If it's in policies and, or procedures, you've got to revise your policies and procedures to align with the requirements. If it's in your practices, you've got to put a process in place to correct those practices, train the personnel, put checkpoints in place. Um, and once all of that has been done, we'll review uh, your correction documentation to verify that you have corrected the systemic issue and are now, therefore, demonstrating 100% compliance with this at the systems level. Remember that all findings of noncompliance have to be corrected as soon as possible, but in no case later than one year. At the individual student level, what this means is you're going to have to have an IEP meeting to determine if the delay was a denial of FAPE. If it was, the team has to determine how much compensatory services are owed, develop a plan, and deliver those compensatory services. We'll review that information and then verify the correction. Um, so that's, uh, and I think the next slide's going to talk about that. Yes, so with your comment sections, make sure that it passes the proverbial greeter at Walmart test. Are your comments clear enough that the greeter at Walmart could read them and figure out what you're talking about? Um, for the 2021 school year, and that's what, this is our current school year, OSEP um, considers that the FY20 reporting year. If the, the reason for the delay continues to be COVID, explain in the comment section why COVID is still impacting the completion of the evaluation process. Um, don't just say COVID delay. Um, and at some point toward the end of the year, we're going to ask you what your good faith efforts have been to address the continued impact of the pandemic. Like I talked about, have you investigated other ways to gather the information that you need? Um, have you talked with test developers to see if there's a way to uh, another, an alternate method to deliver or to, um, to administer the assessment? Be proactive. Once you have identified that you've had a delay for a student, go ahead and have the IEP meeting to determine whether there was a denial of FAPE and whether there's a need for compensatory services. And note that you've already done this in the comments. It will go a long way towards improving outcomes for improving determinations. Um, if you recognize this yourself and go ahead and address it, don't wait for us to identify for you. You know whether you've gone over the 60 days or not. So go ahead and take the appropriate steps. If you begin to see a pattern in delays as you review your data, maybe at the end of the first semester, address it as soon as you recognize it, and then note how you've addressed it in the comments. Again, don't wait for us to identify the noncompliance and tell you to, to correct it. This is not a situation in most cases where um, you, you don't know whether or not it's an ex, uh, a valid reason. Now, again, we'll talk about the COVID-related delays and, and how we're going to handle them later. Um, we do have a significant number of students that COVID impacted, um, but I am, uh, I am saying to make sure that you are, as you started these data are gathering these data or inputting these data again on July 1. Remember that 
Um, there should be a difference in how we're operating this year and what happened in the spring. It doesn't mean that we're all back face to face by any means, um, but just make sure that you are giving more information than just COVID related delay. All right, Sandy, other questions about correction of noncompliance for this? Yes, one question. It says, given that COVID is systemic across the state, would it be possible for the psych rep at the state to do some of that legwork and share that information with the state? We all want to do the very best, i.e. do the assessments in the timeline, but it seems like it's not practical for everyone to make those calls. We could do some of that. However, the variety of assessments that districts are using differ so across the state. Now, you know, I'm, I'm, we could reach out to some, like Pearson owns the world. Um, we could reach out to some of the major test developers, but there will always be ones that are, are specialty assessments or those kinds of things. Um, we have been, Lisa McClimate has been sharing information uh, as, as she gets it and as we get it along the lines of assessments. And um, so make sure that you're in contact with Lisa. I think she's got um, an open hour for office hours for school psychs. So um, email her and ask about that. Uh, but we'll be glad to help in any way we can and, and get that information out to everybody. Other questions? Um, could she put that out to all directors in an email? Yeah, we can include that, sure. I'll work with Lisa on that. That's the um, last question. All right, so just a couple of reminders. We're going to try a monthly office hours call the last Wednesday of each month. You should have gotten the link for that. Um, and this is, it's voluntary. We're not going to record anything. Um, this is an opportunity for you to call our leadership team, which will be our um, team leads that are working with our four focus groups, post-secondary, social, emotional, academic, and early childhood, as well as our data team lead and our fiscal team lead um, and our virtual support team lead will be available to answer questions or, or try to address concerns, um, not specific to any, any, any individual student. If you've got an individual student concern, please contact the appropriate person um, directly with that. Um, but if you've got general questions, general concerns, or just want another set of, of ears to listen to and talk through a, a broad situation, um, we're going to do that. Again, this is completely voluntary. Um, we the National Center for Intensive Intervention is going to be sponsoring another webinar by Dr. Devin Kearns, and it's going to be Making Instructional Adaptations to Maximize Reading Success. Um, when I send out the survey um, following this, I'll also send the flyer for this with the registration information for any of you who attended the last one of these joint um, presentations. It was extremely well received. Um, Devin is very knowledgeable. Um, he is very engaging and has great information. Please share this with your gen ed counterparts. We have shared it with the Office of Early Learning and Literacy folks. Um, and so this is, this is a great opportunity. Um, and that's it. Sandy, other questions? Yes, ma'am. Here's a couple. Can you please clarify the 60 day timeline in regards to our baby net kids? There is, and I said that was a, a mistake on the PowerPoint that I'll correct. There is no 60 day timeline for baby net. The ending point is third birthday. So let's say the child turns three on July 1 
and whatever, if you back up 90 days and you have your transition meeting for C to B in a timely fashion, and for whatever reason, you wait until June 1st to get parent consent to evaluate, then you only have 30 days to evaluate because the ending point is third birthday. And I'll change that on that slide. I just, I tried to save time and copy and paste from indicator 11. So it's not 60, just like with reeval, there is no 60 day timeline for reeval. Um, for reeval, it's either on or before the three year date, or if it's an out of cycle reeval that's been requested, um, you have requested it or somebody has requested that reeval because there are concerns that the IEP is not appropriate in some way. And so that needs to be done as quickly as possible so that you can address the, um, the possible concerns in the IEP. And whatever time that takes, you need to be comfortable defending that amount of time on a due, in, in a due process hearing. In other words, if parent files due process to say it took you 90 days to get this reeval completed and we made major changes as a result of it in the IEP, could you defend why it took that long to get the reeval done knowing that there may have been concerns in the IEP? So 60 day time, sorry, initial timeline for eligibility and IEP in place is the child's third birthday. And, and so this, this indicator ends with an IEP being developed. So you get consent to evaluate, you conduct the evaluation, you determine eligibility, and if the child's eligible, you develop an IEP. That development of the IEP by third birthday is what has to stop that timeline. For indicator 11 and in school age children, then the, or four year old, four through 21, then the stopping is the completion of the evaluation, not eligibility determination and not um, an IP in place. So what a follow up to that was um, someone asked that it's their understanding that even with BabyNet, we have to meet the 60 day timeline. Has that changed? That's never been a requirement. So. Um, again, the evaluation at that age is um, the, the ending of that evaluation period is eligibilities determined. And if yes, then um, you have an IEP in place. The, the reason that whole transition process really is 90 days is to give you a chance to work with the baby net people. And, you know, we are, we are working hard on that relationship so that um, rather than having to start from scratch, you've got time to review existing information that BabyNet already has. You, they have worked hard to um, revise their eligibility criteria. Um, and, and we all know that you can't assume that just because a child was eligible under BabyNet, the child would be eligible under Part B. Um, so that, that's why that time, um, you're given that time to get all of that information. The last and, question, oh, sorry. Sorry, I was just going to say, the other reason that 60-day timeline doesn't apply with this age group is that this age child tends to change so quickly in a shorter period of time. So if you get consent to evaluate on um, the, the day of the transition meeting, and then you finish, let's say in 60 days, you've got 30 more days. If the child has a summer birthday, you may not start the IEP for another three months. Then you've gone four months between when you wrote that IEP and when you actually implement it. And four, four months for a child this age can make a tremendous difference. So you want um, as fresh assessment data as you can have for any IP. Last question, is there an update on defined course codes for special ed classes? Are the appropriate codes listed on the website somewhere? Um, we have done we have not done anything else with course codes. So the ones that came out in the most recent uh, manual from the Office of State and Federal Accountability are the ones that still apply at this point.
There are no other questions. All right, I appreciate everybody's time. I'm sorry we've gone over a little bit. Um, we will, the office hours, remember uh, if you've got questions and we will get this recording and PowerPoint posted as quickly as possible. Everybody, please stay safe and stay healthy.